Welcome to another episode of the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week, I am joined by a returning guest, Chef Matt Larkin, who previously was working in the kitchen at Chapman's. I started out as a line cook there and was uh, actually a sous chef, and then he departed and moved to New York City. So Matt comes back on the podcast, and we chat about how he wound up in New York City, kind of why there, what he's been doing, where he's working now and everything. So it was good to just catch up with Matt. You know, we, from time to time, message each other on Instagram and stuff and keep in touch, especially with uh, all the different latest kind of restaurant articles that come out about some famous restaurant being some toxic place to work. So that's always kind of fun to hit each other up about that stuff. But it's just cool to chat with Matt. You know, previously we talked all about kind of him being in Vietnam and everything and how he wound up in Columbus and all that stuff. But um, this just kind of picks up right where we left off uh, with him the last time. So if you never listened to that episode, make sure to go back into the archive, into the feed there. It's one of the earlier episodes. I don't remember exactly what number it is, but uh, it's definitely among like the first 12. You'll be able to find it and check that out. We talk a lot about Vietnam and everything, but with this episode, we talk about what he's doing now and in New York and future plans and all that stuff too. So uh, you can follow him on Instagram at Pork Stories is his main Instagram. Uh, that's the one where he kind of posts all his food photos and different markets that he's visiting and everything too. So you can live vicariously through his Instagram and all the different farmers markets that he's exploring from day to day. But you can follow us on Instagram too as well at Spoon Mob. Uh, we're also on Twitter and Facebook, Spoon Mob One. Make sure to check out the website, spoonmob.com, for contact information on all our guests, uh, different food photos we have up there, too, for each of the guests and the restaurants that they were working at at the time. We put all those on Instagram as well. Make sure to subscribe, follow the podcast, wherever you get your podcasts from. New episodes on Thursdays. Those episodes will hit YouTube a week later. So if that's your preferred platform instead of all the others, you can uh, follow our channel there, too, as well. But Without any further delays, here's my conversation, a little mini update with uh, Chef Matt Larkin uh, over at Tiny Spoon Chef in New York City. Awesome. Well, since you were first on this podcast, uh, you no longer live in Columbus. You left. You guys moved to New York City. What, uh, what prompted that move? So my wife and I both have always liked being in big cities. Before we moved to Columbus, I was living in Hong Kong, which I absolutely loved. And it was a combination of the, the protests that were happening in 2019 and then COVID in 2020. Uh, it just wasn't a great time to be in uh, the restaurant industry in Hong Kong. So that's what brought us back to Columbus. But um, we had always planned on either going somewhere else after that. Um, and honestly, if it wasn't for BJ and Wes and the team at Chapman's, we probably wouldn't have even stayed in Columbus for that long, but it was, uh, it was such a great fit. As soon as I think we spoke about this last time, as soon as I met BJ, I knew that was a place that I, I really wanted to be. So, uh, yeah, we got an apartment, stayed for a year. And then, uh, once our lease was up, we started, uh, looking for other things. So New York was high on the list of places we've always wanted to live just in terms of, the uh, the opportunities here, the restaurant scene, especially for me is great. So yeah, that was what, uh, was really did it. What other cities were on the short list besides New York? Uh, so we really wanted to go somewhere warm. We were looking at my, my wife is from Texas, so that was definitely up there uh, on the list. Um, we have some friends in Florida. We've always neither one of us has much experience uh, out on the West Coast, but Southern California was definitely up there. Um, to be honest, it was kind of a surprise to both of us that New York was where we landed because we thought uh, we would do one winter in Columbus and then that was going to be the end of it. But <laughs> here we are. Prior to you guys moving to New York City, have you guys ever been there before, visited or anything? A couple of times visiting friends, just kind of doing the tourist stuff, but not much experience. What were your expectations upon moving there? Visiting New York and living in New York, I'm sure two completely different things. But even just from a visiting perspective before COVID and then after COVID, you hear all the stories of, well, there's nobody really around and a bunch of the restaurants are closed and all that stuff. So what were your kind of expectations and did they line up once you got there? Yeah, I think they did. Uh, I mean, we both came into it with a pretty open mind in terms of we didn't really know what we were expecting, um, but we were just kind of excited to see uh, where we landed. So uh, part of it too was my wife's job um, at the time. She's actually switched jobs since then, but at the time her, her boss was living in Morningside Heights um, and we had a friend, uh, one of my really good college friends had just moved to the Upper East Side. So we were excited to be close to those people. Um, we're looking in neighborhoods in Manhattan and we ended up in Harlem, which we absolutely love. Um, 
being so close to Central Park is amazing. That's where we spend a lot of our time. So it's been really nice kind of getting to see all these different sites and scenes that you really, I mean, we'd seen the movies and like Riverside Park and uh, when Harry met Sally and all those movies, like it's cool to actually uh, get to see it in person. So um, I think the the city itself lined up with our expectations. The The restaurant scene was a bit different just because we arrived I don't want to say at the tail end of COVID because it's, uh, it's still ongoing, but sort of in that like that lull last summer where we weren't sure when the vaccines just started coming out and mask mandates were starting to be lifted. We weren't really sure what to expect. Um, and so many people had left the city at the beginning of COVID that it was definitely quieter last summer than it is this summer. Um, it was a lot more outdoor dining still, restrictions on um, indoor dining capacity limits and that sort of thing. So it wasn't the the overwhelming, hectic, super busy New York City that I think we had kind of seen in like the movies and TV. So it was a nice, like easy adjustment, uh, kind of landing in a, in the city in a quiet moment and, uh, getting some time to, to get our feet under us. I'm curious what New York's like. Cause I mean, I went to San Francisco for a couple of days and it'd been a couple of years since we've been there and it was the first time post COVID is just a completely different vibe. Like there's like no restaurants open really for lunch anymore. Like there's people around downtown, but I mean, they obviously have a, a homeless crisis, you know, kind of there. So you're in the middle of that, depending on what block you're in. And it, it was just a weird vibe. It wasn't like the San Francisco was like that I visited, you know, two, three times before. So I was curious if New York was kind of like that or not, but it sounds like New York kind of rebounded a, a bit quicker, and a bit more like it was. It seems like it's coming back. I mean, I think in terms of the like midtown where all the high rise offices are, that seems to be quieter than what it used to be from what I've heard from clients that work downtown. They say that like the trains aren't as busy, the, the streets aren't as busy, the, the lunch cafes aren't quite as busy. But I think the the nightlife, the the parks, the the kind of neighborhoods outside of the the office districts seem to be pretty lively still. So how'd you wind up with Tiny Spoon Chef, which is uh, where you're at now? Yeah, so I'm doing personal chefing now, which is a, a much different pace than restaurant life, uh, which is what I wanted. That was a big part of the reason that um, we left Columbus in the first place was that um, as much as I love Chapman's and the team that we had there, uh, I just was kind of tired of working until midnight every day. So there were more opportunities to continue to have a knife in my hand every day, but not exactly uh, in that restaurant. So we, we moved here and I was looking for jobs, whether it was like kind of like daytime catering gigs and cafe gigs, things like that. Um, and found the job listing for Tiny Spoon Chef on a, on a job site and met them, did a tasting with them and really got a, I had a good interaction with the, the bosses on that first tasting and in the interview process. So I uh, decided that was, I'd give it a try and I've been uh, really enjoying it since then. I looked them up. They're like a Northeast kind of company. Uh, I think they're originally from Boston, but like Boston, Cape Cod, they do stuff in Connecticut, New York, where you're at. And I think like Chicago was kind of like the furthest west that they were, but it's mostly like that New England, Northeast kind of cluster. I'm assuming kind of the main draw, you know, was, was the flexibility in the hours. The company was started almost 10 years ago in Boston by uh, our founder, Janice. Uh, and it's, it's been totally grassroots growth since since then. So when she started the company, she was doing everything herself, doing the, the sales, the advertising, the cooking. Uh, it was definitely a one woman show. Um, and she got a great response and has slowly been adding chefs to the roster over the past nine years. And I think Connecticut was the first city they expanded to outside of Boston. And that was two years ago. Um, and then I was actually the first chef in New York to join the team here. Um, and yeah, just kind of slowly, slowly going down the coast. So I think, uh, yeah, New, um, New Jersey is the newest city that we're in and Chicago also was a few months ago that we are, um, yeah, trying to, trying to grow our reach. Like they do meal planning, but they do like kind of meal prep kits, but do they also do like events and stuff too? Like what is the whole, you're doing a few different things. It's not just like we build a kit thing. And that's another part that I really like is that it's a very personalized bespoke service. So it's all in-home prep. We get to know our clients pretty well. Uh, there's like, there's an intake survey and those sorts of things to, to get things started. But once I show up for that first cooking session, I get to know you, your family, your kids, your spouse, whatever, uh, figure out what you guys like. And then I'll show up once a week, twice a week, maybe depending on your needs. And I will 
prep a bunch of meals for you for the week, whether it's things that you can take, just like pack and go grab with you to the office, uh, after school snacks for the kids, um, like meal dinner prep, where um, sometimes it's fully composed meals. Sometimes it's like, I'll do half, half of the work for you. So you just kind of like gotta put a sauce on something and throw it in the oven for a few minutes. Um, so that's, that is definitely the bulk of our services, the, the in-home meal prep. Um, but yeah, we also do events. Um, so private dinner parties, uh, catering gigs, things like that. Um, and yeah, we, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So it gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of freedom to do lots of different things. And then because it's bespoke, I'm assuming that they can kind of tailor things to people's ingredient preferences in terms of if they're vegan or if they're gluten-free or... Yeah, we do all sorts of dietary restrictions, preferences, whatever it is. We treat it as a menu list service. So there's not like a, a set of options that you can choose from. It's up to the client and the chef to kind of figure out what the menu is. So if you tell me you love Italian food um, and you love Thai food, then yeah, I can come up with a bunch of different Italian and Thai dishes to, to work with you. But say you, I don't know, you, you love Chinese food, but you hate eggplant, then that's totally something we can do. It doesn't have to be like, all right, well, you don't like that. So we're taking that off the table. It's uh, yeah, it's a lot of mixing and matching and coming up with exactly what you need. So when I show up for that weekly service, the idea is that you come home to a fridge full of food that's tailored specifically to your taste. And for you, that's got to be also fun that you're not stuck with one type of cuisine. Like if you're working at a restaurant, you know, and this restaurant does new American, like you're cooking new American every day that you're there. But depending on what your client base is, like you could have one client that, like you said, is is really big into Thai food. So that's what you're cooking. But then the other one could be like, yeah, this week I just want like fruits, vegetables and healthy greens. And so you're going like the healthy route. You kind of get to experience a little bit of all of it, depending on who your clients are and what they want. So much fun. Yeah, I'm exposed to so much now just because I, I mean, I know what I like and I, what I like to cook, but uh, my clients are all over the place. So in a given week, I could be cooking anywhere from 40 to 50 different dishes just for that week. And then the next week, it's something totally different, which is really fun. Um, it gives me a lot of time to look through all my old cookbooks and old recipes and research different blogs. Um, I've got a couple of clients that are fully vegan, which is something that I don't have much experience in. So it's been really fun diving into that type of cuisine and figuring out all these fun, different vegan recipes that um, I never would have thought of without the, the client suggestion, but it's, it's really cool. Um, and stuff that I ended up, I'll take these ideas and bring home and cook them for myself because it's something that uh, I really, really enjoyed. So it's, it definitely opens up a lot of possibilities, which is really cool. I'm assuming ingredient shopping for you now is just as important as the planning aspect or the menu development. I think you're at farmer's markets, like, I don't know, almost every day based on your Instagram. Yeah, that is a huge highlight of the job that uh, I get to spend some time at. I mean, the New York farmer's markets are incredible. The The quality of produce and the just the different array of farms that are here on a weekly basis is really fun. So it's nice being able to go in. And of course, because we're not doing the... Um, industrial cooking, cooking for a hundred people at a time. It is very much, I, I show up at the market with my one shopping bag and get to pick through the best things. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool. The markets there, I'm assuming there's like one probably every day, right? Like it's a different location, but, and I think there might be a couple standalone ones maybe that are open every day, but I'm assuming it's different parts of the city. The markets run every single day, seven days a week. There's going to be a market somewhere, but you're right. They do, they do switch around. So they like the Union Square Market, which is my favorite. Um, they're every, they're there four days a week, so it definitely does line up with. It has to line up with the client's schedule. Um, not all of my clients do the farmers market shopping. Some of them have their their local independent stores. Um, we do a lot of online grocery delivery, things like that. There are so many independent butchers and fishmongers and specialty stores that uh, it really takes me all over the city, which is really fun. I'm not just ordering from a catalog and sending emails and seeing what shows up. So it's it's a bit more hands-on than what I'm used to in the restaurant industry. How's the break from daily restaurant life been? It's been a really refreshing change. I mean, there are certainly things that I miss. Coming from a restaurant like Chapman's, was that was a dream scenario. So that was, that was hard to say goodbye to. But just being able to be home at six o'clock. I actually get to eat dinner with my wife now, which is something that we uh, rarely got to do in Columbus together. Having nights and weekends off has been a really, really nice change of pace for uh, my social life. So that's been, it's been fun. It's not, I would say it's not quite as exciting as a, a busy Saturday night service. I think that's, that's a hard rush to beat, but uh, I think the trade-off is well worth it. 
Yeah, and it's not like you can't always go back into that world if you want. Restaurants are always looking for people. Throw a rock and you'll find somebody that needs your help in the kitchen for sure. What's next on like the New York City dining list for you guys? I think you guys went to Le Bernardin. We did. We went to Le Bernardin uh, right after we got married. Yeah, that was our, our wedding dinner, which was so much fun. Uh, and there's so many good sushi places here. That's another one that both of us love Japanese food. So there's a, I've got a list of a few different uh, omakase places where we're hoping to try out. Um, I think what else? There was something else that was... Oh, and pizza, obviously. There's so many different pizza places. So we've got a, we've been working, working our way through uh, our favorite spots in Manhattan. Um, but it's a, it's a big world out there. So lots of other places to try. I forget the name of it. There's that one in New Jersey that's really famous. I think it's like Anthony Maginari is like the owner, the guy who found it. I can't remember. Una Napolitana or something like that. I know that one's famous. And there's like one in Brooklyn where like you have to wait outside for like hours or something. I can't remember the name of that one either. But yeah, there's some there's some famous ones. I would say the the other thing that we're really excited about here is that coming from Vietnam, there's so much good Vietnamese food here. And there's a there's a pop up actually happening right now called Mom M A M that they uh they're doing a three month pop up downtown in Chinatown. That I think that's what we're we're also trying to get there in the next couple of months before they they close up the doors. Have you found any New York City or very regional specific snacks that don't exist in Columbus? Since now you have access to all these bodegas. Oh, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if there's anything unique other than maybe the the classic chopped cheese, which I am a huge fan of. So that's the, my local my local deli um, is a staple for me. Lots of sandwiches there. I think one thing that I was pleasantly surprised by is the amount of halal carts here. That's something that I eat on a regular basis. Is uh, I love falafel, and there is, seems like to be a, a falafel cart in every other corner in this city. So there's a lot to choose from. You guys think you'll be in New York City long term, short term, couple years? I have no idea. Uh, moving was such a hassle. So we're we're definitely not eager to do that anytime soon. Yeah, we both really like it here. There's a lot of opportunities where, I mean, it's this is an impossible city to be bored in. So yeah, we're, we're still having fun. No, no plans to move on yet. Do you think eventually you might consider like staging in, uh, I don't know, like a Michelin restaurant in the city or something like that if you get some days off? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I love fine dining. I think it's so exciting. And I think what a lot of these chefs are doing is so groundbreaking and really beautiful. So um, to have that skill set would be, and that experience would be so much fun. But I am moving more away from restaurant cooking and more towards um, like community cooking. There are also a ton of food banks, um, a lot of like community kitchens, um, free fridges, that sort of thing that really, really interests me. Uh, we are being in Harlem, we're very close to a lot of the Harlem grown uh, community gardens, and they do a lot of cooking classes for kids and school kids in the neighborhood, neighborhood cooking demonstrations for families, uh, things like that. And I think that's kind of my next next uh, big idea is to do more of like the institutional and uh, community cooking. Yeah, there's also, I forget his name. He has a like a tasty menu restaurant in Harlem. But he's using like Southern African like ingredients, African American ingredients. I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head. I'll have to find it. So if people want to book a consult through, they just go to tinyspoonchef.com and put your name in. Yeah, that'll connect you with our sales team. And uh, I know we, uh, yeah, so we're in those cities I mentioned, Boston, Westport, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Chicago. And I think there are some more cities planned uh, at the end of this year and next year. So we are, we're continuing to grow. And if we get enough demand, then we're, we're always happy to go anywhere. That's one of the cool things about our company is that it is so uh, word of mouth that the reason we're in Chicago was that a few of the Boston chefs used to work in Chicago. So they had chef friends there that were looking to do a similar style of service. And they had regulars from the restaurant in Chicago that were familiar with what they were doing in Boston that were asking like, oh, are you guys ever going to come to a different city and offer that service here? So with enough demand, we are, we're happy to go anywhere. Man, it was good catching up and I'm glad that, you know, you found an opportunity in New York that you're excited about. You know, I get to live vicariously through you, uh, through your Instagram and you're going through all the markets and stuff and I'm like, oh yeah, New York, New York would be cool. It's a very exciting city to, to eat in, that's for sure. Yeah. Like I said, it's awesome to, to see you kind of explore something new and something that you seem pretty passionate about. So definitely following along and and keep in touch and you know wishing you the best and uh, i'm sure we'll see you soon i'm sure you'll make your way back here or who knows yeah hopefully soon yeah thanks for having me back it was great to chat again good to catch up
Again, a big thanks to Matt for coming back on the podcast. It's always great to catch up with him and, and what he's got going on. And like I said, live vicariously through his Instagram and different travels, places he's eaten at in New York, different farmers markets that he's checking out too as well. So again, you can follow him at Pork Stories, also at Tiny Spoon Chef is their account on Instagram too as well. You can follow us there at Spoon Mom. Check out the website, spoonmom.com. Write in questions, comments, feedback. Either email us directly, spoonmob at yahoo.com, or through our webpage. There's a contact page and a little portal where you can enter your name and contact information and what you want to submit. If you have any questions that you'd ever wanted to ask a chef or a or anything, feel free to write those in. Uh, we'll kind of assign those to the best guest uh, coming up after we do our research and uh, get those on the episode. And then we'll hit you up uh, by email or whatever let you know what episode uh, your question that you wrote in is coming out. So that's been a lot of fun to integrate that in the podcast. And just make sure to follow us. Uh, more episodes on the way. So every Thursday, new episodes come out right now. And then we're doing these mini uh, update episodes that come out kind of Monday, Tuesdays, um, kind of once we get them recorded and everything. So there's no real set uh, release, but it's a little bonus for everybody who subscribed to the podcast. And we appreciate everybody listening and continue to listen. And we will talk to you guys next week.